tell you, oh, that's it. That's what you gotta do. You gotta praise your way, mama. Oh, and feel your hope. Woo! Oh, everybody, oh. You gotta know where to put your faith. I believe the words go something like this. Say, trust in him who will not leave you. his presence to those who I share ministerial collegiality with. I have brothers here, friends here, confidants here, and we're grateful and thankful to God to all of these men and women of God who are present with us today. Can we thank God for all of our pastors and ministers who are present here today. If you are a pastor or minister, you're sitting in the audience, we know who's up here, but will you kindly stand? We always like to acknowledge those persons. If you are here, will you stand so that people can see who you are? Amen. Dr. Richardson is here. Amen. Others are here. Some of you are masked. I can't tell who's who, but we're grateful and thankful to the Lord for your being here today. Now we're going to follow our program as it has been Printed. Someone say printed. I want you to look at this program very closely. If you do not see your name, that's for a reason. It means that you're not on this program. And no changes will be made to this program unless the family gives me instructions to do so. Other than that, we're going to follow it as it is printed. Our invocation, that's a prayer be given by Minister Frank Dolphin, our scripture reading, Old Testament, Elder Floyd Reed, New Testament, Elder Ornitha Kale. We'll have a musical selection by Miss Leandria Stevens. 
resolution by Pastor Shanique Andrews, reflection, limited, limited to two minutes according to the program only. As a deacon, Deacon Doran Porter, as a neighbor, Mr. Alonzo Kendrick, as an uncle, Reverend Gloria Davis, Pastor Alfonso Jackson Sr., Deacon Alex Jackson, Pastor Art Jackson the third. I want to see how that's going to go for three minutes, for two minutes here. Yeah, right. As I knew him, as I knew him, uh, the brother of Deacon Carter, Reverend Roosevelt Carter Sr., and um, we're going to change a little bit on the program and put the video after the, after the uh, eulogy at the end of the service if I've been instructed. Um, and uh, in his own words, uh, will be after the words of comfort. Acknowledgement, Paradise Memorial Funeral Home, musical tribute, Mr. Gentle Hamilton III, then another musical selection, uh, Pepper Praise Team, then words of comfort, Apostle Carlos Malone. Okay, God bless you. We thank you so much. Can we give God another hand of praise? <laughs> Let me just say, just for clarity, just for clarity, if you see me going out and coming back, coming back in, there's nothing wrong with my bladder. It's just that I have an issue with my legs, uh, so uh, I'm just waiting for treatment. So y'all just pray. Uh, I just want to have enough strength to do what God called me to do. Amen. So if I can move in and out, and it's all good. Okay. Praise the Lord. Just one. Good morning, saints. I greet you all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Thank you once again for coming, those that travel near and far to come and celebrate the life of our beloved brother, Deacon Edward Carter. Um, I was elated when they asked me to speak, to just pray. Um, the experience of losing a loved one is never easy, especially if somebody that has made such an impact and mark on um, our lives. Also, we greet, um, thank you for those that are viewing from a distance that was not able to make it to celebrate it with a family. Family, also know that we are very appreciative to those that came to help us celebrate the life of um, Edward Deacon Carter. I joined this church in 1995. Once again, King of King, Lord of Lords, thank you for the opportunity and the privilege, Lord, to, to just be in your presence, to be in the land of the living. Lord, we ask that you bring comfort to the family and friends, Lord, of Edward Deacon Carter. He will truly be missed, Lord. We know that he did a great work in your kingdom, and Lord, everything that he did, he did it, and it was real. And once again, Lord, we say thank you for having the opportunity and privilege, Lord, to witness a giant in ministry such as Edward Deacon Carter. Lord, we love you. And we appreciate you. Now, Lord, give us comfort, Lord, as we shed our tears, as we cry, Lord. You know, visit the family, Lord, in their time of darkness, Lord, and let them know, Lord, that you are a God that does what you want to do. And, of course, Lord, we know that it will come a time when, once again, we will see each other face to face. And, Lord, as he enter in to his rest, Lord, know that you will say, well done, that good and faithful servant. Thank you. Be reading you the Old Testament. Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, creator of all the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can phantom. He gives strength to the weary and increase the power of the weak. Even the youth grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those, those who hope in the Lord, will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Amen.
Essence, love, and condolences to Mrs. Carter and family from the Senior Saints Ministry. New Testament scripture reading. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18 from the Message Translation. And regarding the question, friends, that has come up about what happens to those already dead and buried, we don't want you to be in the dark any longer. First off, you must not carry on over them like people who have nothing to look forward to, as if the grave were the last words. Since Jesus died and broke loose from the grave, God will most certainly bring back to life those who died in Jesus. And then this, we can tell you with complete confidence, we have the master's word on it, that when the master comes again to get us, those of us who are still alive will not get a jump on the dead and leave them behind. In actual fact, they'll be ahead of us. The master himself will give the command, Archangel, thunder, God's trumpet, blast. He'll come down from heaven and the dead in Christ will rise. They'll go first. Then the rest of us who are still alive at the time will be caught up with them into the clouds to meet the master. Oh, we'll be walking on air. And then there will be one huge family reunion with the master. So reassure one another with these words. honor to God and everybody in their respectable places. My love and condolences to the Carter family. I'm Leandra. I have lived next door to Mr. Carter all of my life and I grew up going back and forth over there to the house. So I was honored when they asked me to sing. I'm going to try to do my best. Um, feel free to sing along. Oh how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the land. There is power, power, wonder working power. It's in the precious blood of the land. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the land. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the land. Oh, can't nobody. Lord, oh, oh, can't nobody 
Resolution, honoring the life and legacy of Deacon Emeritus Edward C. Carter. Be thou faithful unto date, and I will give thee a crown of life. Revelation, second chapter, verse 10. Blessed are the dead who died in the Lord from now on. Yes, said the Spirit which they shall rest from their labors and their work will follow them. Revelations 14 and 13. Whereas the Bethel Church family and friends are gathered today with the family and friends of Deacon Emeritus Edward C. Carter, we celebrate his life and legacy. An honored pioneer of the Bethel Church Deacon Edward Carter was a man who was steadfast in his faith and in his Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Deacon Carter had been a member of the Bethel Church for over 70 years. He was a dean as a deacon September 1974, served faithfully for 40 years, and was esteemed to the title of Deacon Emeritus. Elder Carter vigorously served as chairman of the board of trustees and deacons. His service continued as a member of the count team, fellowship ambassador of the Bethel Church, men's ministry, and assisting in Sunday school. Deacon Carter also served as a member of the pastoral search committee and the male chorus. Deacon Carter will be affectionately remembered mostly for his thunderous laughter and his love of singing his favorite songs. A charge to keep I have. Let it be real and try Jesus. On May 22nd, 2016, as a legend of the Bethel Church, Deacon Edward C. Carter Try Jesus Award was created in his honor. He was a living witness for his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and he wanted everyone he met to know about Jesus. This award is annually awarded to any member who exemplifies Deacon Carter witness for, for Jesus Christ. Whereas, we embrace Deaconess Ida Carter and family and extend our heartfelt sympathy, prayers, and love as we share remembrance of our beloved Deacon Edward Carter. May you be comforted in the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in John 14 and 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you, not as this world give. I give, gives, give I to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Therefore, be it resolved that we the Bethel Church are profoundly grateful to God for the life and ministry of Deacon Edward Carter and counted all joy to be in relationship and fellowship with this good and faithful servant. We honor his faithfulness to the gospel of Jesus Christ and his work of ministry and his integrity as a deacon and as a leader. We are confident that Deacon Emeritus Edward Carter will receive the pronunciation that only God can give. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord. Be it further resolved 
that a copy of this resolution will be placed in the archives of the Bethel Church and a copy will be presented to the family of Deacon Emeritus Elder Deacon Emeritus Edward Carter. To God be the glory. I respectfully submitted Apostle Carlos L. Malone Sr., Servant Leader. There was a time of pastor anniversary. Let's go get Deacon Carter because he can raise the roof. I don't know if I'll ever get that distinction, but I'll try. But some of the songs that I love to hear him sing, it was like a charge to keep I have and a God to glorify. Also, his hit, another hit song <laughs> was Zachariah, come on down. The Lord can't use you till you come on down. But his number one hit, when Dr. Holloway would be sitting at the piano over there when she was in charge of the chorus, and she would try to find that note. <laughs> try Jesus, he's all right. Try Jesus. Oh, he's all right. Try Jesus. Oh, he's all right. My God, man, he's all right. Apostle, that was some somebody at a at a home going that spoke at that podium. I'm not gonna be that person. You know who you are. Edward Carter, relax. Back in the day, it used to be where uh, they had a saying where if a male figure would walk in your house on the first of the year, your house would be protected for the rest of the year. Mr. Carter made sure that he walked in pretty much everybody on the block. <laughs> he didn't have a issue either with, uh, as they say, spatter rod, spoil the child with the kids in the block. There was an incident um, with a car. Uh, I'm not going to call no names, but some of the people might be here. They decided to play tic-tac-toe with, <laughs> with the eraser on the hood of the car. It was a dark blue car. Uh, I think he caught one of the brothers that did it. He ran home. But the problem was he lived like a house away. <laughs> so, um, 
And the other thing is that um, he and Ms. Carter, Ms. Carter wanted that shed cleaned out, well, emptied out. He was asking for Chris, uh, help me clean the shed out, take, throw, throw some of this stuff away. So I'm packing the truck up to the shed. I'm loading stuff in, in the truck. No, 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 no. I need that. <laughs> okay, put it back. Load some more stuff. No, 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 no. I need that. So Ms. Carter hit me and him going back and forth. And she tells me, say, Chris, just give up. Elliot will be home in about a couple of weeks. He'll help him out. So I come, Elliot come home. <laughs> I go by there. Elliot said, man, please help. <laughs> All he want to do is move stuff around. <laughs> he don't want to throw nothing away. And as he got older, take him to his doctor's appointment. He had a doctor in Color Ridge. We leave in Color Ridge. He had another doctor's appointment at uh, Kimber Drive. Now, where I worked at off of Kimber Drive on 107th, his doctor's office was across the street. I worked there for 31 years. I didn't go the way he wanted me to go. <laughs> and we got into an argument about that. So I had to tell him, like I, I, I tell, I tell, used to tell my kids, we're going to play the quiet game. <laughs> Just be quiet. But uh, he will be deeply missed. And I just want to bless the family. Y'all have a good day. Praise the Lord, everybody. I'm Reverend Gloria Jackson Davis. Thank you. On August 8th, 2002, nearly 20 years ago, our dad, the late Reverend Dr. Arthur Jackson Jr., went home to be with the Lord. At dad's home going service, Uncle Elwood came to me that day, and he said, Dad is gone, but I promise I'll be here for you. Whatever you need, whatever your dad would have done for you, he says, I promise I'll be there for you. Through the hugs and the tears, I managed to compose myself to tell Uncle Elwood, that once a month, on the first of the month, dad always gave me a big fat check. <laughs> we laughed so hard as we formed the bond of more than uncle and niece to more than father and daughter. I have never missed celebrating his birthday in these 20 years. Christmas, Father's Day that just passed, not knowing that that would be the last one. Or just because days, because I love Uncle Edward just like my dad. I will miss our lunch days when he would catch the Metro Rail and come north and I would take the train and meet him south. Today, we have this service, and there's so many nieces and nephews. Uncle Edward would have me to tell all of the nieces and the nephews. Would you please stand? Nieces, nephews. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Uncle Edward would have me to say for the very last time, that I was his favorite.
Thank you, Auntie Ida, Sharon, Charles, Teresa, and Elliot for sharing this awesome and amazing man who transformed our lives when we needed him the most. I spoke for everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good evening. Good morning. We greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, the risen Christ. This is a hard task. It's hard because we were so close. to the pastor, all of my ecclesiastical constituents, brothers and sisters, God is a miracle working God. I've been pastoring 40 years, and I'm nervous today that I have been since I preached my first sermon. I'm nervous because certain people, when you do things, you want to do it right. Because he deserved that. I noticed on the program, they said two minutes. Well, I told y'all I was a pastor. <laughs> I don't know no preachers, pastors, can talk for two minutes. But Edward Carter, my hero, the boss, and he let you know he was the boss. Matter of fact, my mama thought he was the boss. <laughs> I don't know how he fooled mama, but she thought he could do anything. Elwood down here, and I'm up there, and whatever I want to do, she said, call Elwood. I said to myself, call Elwood. But Elwood was the one that saw about the family. He took care of the family. I had siblings that loved one another. But my brother Roe, he was the oldest, and Edward, they was the workaholics. They worked. I mean, they worked in the field until they left there to find a better life. Now, <laughs> Edward always wanted to be in charge. I can tell you that. Rome was the muscular one. He was built. I remember one Brother Elwood, since he wanted me to boss, he hit me. And my brother Rose, what you hit him for? He said, being manic. 
I never forgot that. I was a little boy, and my brother Rome grabbed him and held him. He said, come here, hit him. I said, hit him, hit him back. Yeah, we tried to get loose. He couldn't shake loose. So I hit him. Boom. He said, hit him hard. I said, hit him. I ain't want to hit him too hard. But I brought him back. I said, well, let me get him for all them other times. <laughs> I, I put one on him. <laughs> and when I put it on him, and my brother wrote, turned him loose. I thought he was going to get me. He looked at me. And he told my brother, now I could have got loose. <laughs> I'll let you have that one. I said, okay. Well, we were so close until it was three of us, three boys at that time and we all had to sleep together. I don't know where my mother found that bed, but that was the smallest bed. <laughs> and I had two big brothers. I mean, they was big boys. And I got to crawl over and get in the middle. When I get in the mill, it was a bad sleep. I mean, he threw his legs, and I'm trying to get them off me. And Lord, that's how close we were. Whether we wanted to be close or not, we, we, we have no choice. When you get up, you got to crawl over them. But you know, those are great memories. I remember very well when Edward came to Miami, he brought my mother a car. I don't think my mother ever had a car. She always had a truck. He brought, the, he brought that car, station wagon. i never forget it. It was a green station wagon. And he brought that station wagon. And Mama wouldn't let nobody drive it. But Daddy. And finally, she let me drove it. And Katie and I was in it. I was coming home. I don't know if I went to sleep. I ran off the road. But I hit a mailbox. And when I hit the mailbox, I didn't tell nobody. But I knew Kate was going to tell it. Because she told everything. But I didn't hurt the old car. Well, the bottom line is, that was the end of my driving. I didn't touch it no more. But I want to leave this with you for a moment. My sister-in-law, Ida, my mother loved Ida. Could nobody do no wrong. She loved Ida. And you know, I was amazed because I never heard of Ida at that time. And I was wondering when did Ida and it would get together. Ida lived in DeSoto. It would live in Lee County. That's about four or five miles apart. They tell me to speed it up. That's what my niece tell me. See, she's just like her daddy. <laughs> now, 
just like his daddy. <laughs> now, if it come from up here and they tell me to speed up, I speed up all the time. Amen. <laughs> Thank God for time. Let me say this. My niece told me to speed up. I have my marching orders. I want to leave this with you. It was very competitive. I cut my story short. And every time he'd come home, he would always love to play cards with somebody in the family. I could play checkers. I couldn't play cards. But Edward had a little cheating spirit. <laughs> you, you wasn't going to beat him. I remember they was playing cards. P-knuckle. And he going to change the rule. And they said, you can't do that. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. He called all the way to Miami to verify that he was right. And when they told him he was wrong, he said, they got it wrong. <laughs> they have it wrong. All right, now my wife's telling me to hurry up. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Listen. <laughs> Reverend Jackson. Well. I heard up. I'm going to hurry up for you. Amen. But I was about to say, and I finished when my niece tried to get me to hurry up. Ida, how my mother loved Ida. I'm going to finish that. And, um, and I, I said, I, I don't remember Ida. And I told my sister, I said, yeah, when he was here, I didn't know he was cold out of She said, he must have been going through the woods. <laughs> Say, I don't remember him. Amen. But they got together. They got together. Thank God for Elwood. Thank God for the legacy. Thank God for everything that he did. Now, I have one more thing that I want. Have everybody here that need to hear this. And it is not, it wasn't a mistake. That was the divine, divine providence of God to have y'all here. Because uh, I, I, I wanted to say this some time ago. Now y'all don't have to worry about giving me a lot of flowers. I saw my flowers. I smelled my flowers yesterday. They all was here. You don't have to make the floors rich. And Elliot, thank you. Thank you for being a man, thank you for all of this stuff that you've done and still doing. Sharon, I want to thank you. You, you don't always call me on Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. My brothers and sisters, there's nobody that can do you like Jesus. He's everything that we need. For in times like this, we need a savior. And in times like this, we need an anchor. <clears throat> but be sure, be very, very sure that your anchor grips and holds the solid rock. That rock is Jesus giving honor to all the men and women of the gospel, to the pastor, and to all of you that have come 
to share and show your love to this family. We, the Paradise staff, would like to thank you for your kindness that you've shown them during their time of bereavement. Your cars, letters, email, text messages, phone calls, covered dishes, but most of all, your prayers. And at a later date, at a more opportune time, this family will thank you in a personal way. There were some that went a step further, purchased floor arrangements. They would not be acknowledged at this time, but the family do say thank you. Closing, I would just like to say, you know, I was here last night at the <clears throat> family hour that they had during the public viewing time. But I met Deacon Carter when I was about 18 years old. I was at Mount Olive Missionary Baptist Church in South Miami. And we were having the pastor's anniversary. And I just remember this big guy coming in about six three, six four, and they were telling me this is the man from down south in Richmond Heights that can just tear up a church with his devotion. And when he came there, he did just that. And at that time, I was in uh, what they called back then junior deacon. And when we came down to Bethel, the old Bethel, there was no way that I would get up here and do any song or anything in front of Deacon Carter because I remember those days when Deacon Carter, Deacon Mitchell, uh, Deacon Williams, and, and Deacon Bruton, you get those four in a room together, you can all, after they finish, you can just do the uh, benediction and go home. But today we are here to serve this brother and I, like I said, I loved this guy for a long, long, long time until maybe about a year ago I stopped loving him because I found out sometimes when I got home, my wife was missing. And I wonder where was my wife? I know she is with Faye Williams somewhere, but where is my wife? And they come home after 11 o'clock. PM. And I found out they were down there playing cards with him. <laughs> so that's when I stopped loving him. <laughs> you know, so our brother's gone on to be with the Lord. And we've heard all these songs that he's sang. And I just know that he's up in glory. He's up in glory. Singing a charge to keep I have a God to glorify. Whatever you do for Jesus, let it be real. My brothers and sisters, low down chariot and let me ride. My brother has his ticket and he's gone on to glory. God bless you. That's how we remember Dad. Everyone knows that Dad loves to sing songs of praise. But if you spend any time around him, you know something else about him. He loved to laugh. He loved to play games and have fun. If you will allow our family just a few minutes, we'd like to share with you some of the laughter that he's brought to us over the years. Get us another player, will you, Rod? I'll do it, Bob. Edward Carter, come on down. You're the next contestant on the prize is right. Here comes Edward. He's 
the man. I can tell. They love Edward. Right there's your spot, Edward. Now, let's... What do you bid, Edward? Uh... Seven hundred dollars. Kevin, you're seven hundred dollars. I'm hot now. Oh my God! Oh goodness, you got me. Uh, you got me there, Joshua. Yes, sir. Yeah, well. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> It was always so nice. <laughs> 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 Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on. My, my cousin Edward would say, if you're looking for something sad, you've come to the wrong place. But this is a celebration. Praise God. I consider it an honor to, to be here this morning, giving honor to Jesus, our risen Christ, giving honor to the pastor of this house, to the ministerial staff, to the family, all of my family, some I haven't seen in a long time. Uh, but it's a blessing 
to just be here. Um, the deacon who came a few moments ago talked about the hits. And I will admit to you, I can't sing the hits like Cousin Edward would sing them. But I'm going to do the best I can. Um, I thank God for his legacy. I thank God for his influence. You know, Cousin Edward would sing those songs from way back. I like to call them the songs that brought us over. We sing songs now that are a little sophisticated now. But these songs that Cousin Edward would sing and that my grandmother used to sing and that my grandfather used to sing, these are the songs that weren't, weren't too complex, very simple. Call and response kinds of songs, congregational songs. And the one that called had an experience, had a testimony, and the ones who responded could connect to the testimony. If you know what I'm talking about, somebody say amen in the house. And Cousin Edward was one who could master singing these songs. So I need you to help me out this morning. Sing along with me because that's what he would want us to do. He would want us to celebrate. Just like he did 13 years ago when he sang for devotion for my grandmother when she would transfer, uh, transition to be with the Lord. And I would have never known that I would be here this morning singing for him. But I consider it an honor. So if you could help me out. Try Jesus. Oh, he's all right. Try Jesus. Oh, he's all right. Try Jesus. Oh, he's all right. He said, I done tried a man. He's all right. Try Jesus. Oh, he's all right. Try Jesus, oh, try Jesus, oh, said I don't try to man, anybody a testimony, he'll be your doctor, yes, in a sick room, yes, he's all, try Jesus, oh, he's, said I don't try to man, he's all, He'll be your lawyer, yes he will. He's all. He'll be your lawyer, yes he will. He's all. Try Jesus, oh he said I don't try to man. Listen, let it be real. Let it be real. Let it be real. Let it be real. Everything you do for Jesus, let it be real. Anybody know about it? Oh, let it be real. Come on, help me out. Let it be real. Cousin Edward would say, everything you do for Jesus, let it be Whenever you sing, let it be Whenever you sing, everything you do for Jesus, let it be know about it. Let it be real. Oh, everything you do for Jesus, let it be. Whenever you pray, let it be. Whenever you pray, I have everything you do for Jesus. Come on, can you just put your hands together like that? See, what I like about the old church you didn't need a whole lot. You could just put your feet on the floor and put your hands together and think about the goodness of the Lord. And see, Cousin Edwin, he was a testimony of the goodness and the grace of the Lord that we serve. So I used to love to hear Cousin Edwin sing this one. It was a straight bar. Come on, sing with me. Oh, Lord, our chariot. Oh, Lord, our chariot, ah, Lord, our chariot, oh, Lord, our chariot, we don't sing it like that no more, oh, Lord, our chariot, oh, Lord, our chariot, oh, Lord, our chariot, yeah, 
hear my cousin say, Oh, there's joy in the chariot. There's joy in the chariot. Oh, there's joy in the chariot. Yes, a low down chariot. Listen, he said, I've got my chicken. I've got my chicken. Everybody gonna see him. See King Jesus. Oh, gonna see King Jesus. Oh, Lord, I'll tell ya. Come on, no music this time. Gonna see King Jesus. Come on, let's have some church. See King Jesus. One of these days, see King Jesus. Oh, Lord, I'll tell ya. Okay, go ahead on and praise him. I don't have no problem with that. Just go ahead on and praise him. As we prepare to hear what God will say to us today. We're so grateful again and so thankful to the Lord our God for all of you who have come. To those who are watching us by way of streaming live. And we greet you in the name of Jesus our Christ. If you don't mind, will you reach over and touch someone? I know we're in this COVID situation stuff, but if you, if you don't mind, just touch somebody if you want to. If you feel uncomfortable, you don't have to. Father, we thank you now. Thank you for this moment in time. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy towards us. Thank you for giving us another chance to get it right. Thank you for this day that we've never seen before you've graced us with the gift of life we thank you today for this this family who have come to celebrate the life and the legacy of their loved one we pray your continual strength in all of us because one Edward Carter impact all of our lives on so many levels. And we thank you for his life. His, his presence was always felt and his absence will be felt as well. But the hope we have is far greater than the pain we feel. Because one thing for sure, he didn't like doctors, hospitals, and nurses, no way. He didn't like being on dialysis. He didn't like all the treatments. So now he doesn't have to worry about it. You have given him victory. He already has a victory over death because Jesus Christ gave him that. But now, God, you have, he has victory over life. 
kept the faith. And now he's resting. And his works are going to follow him. So now, God, in this moment, help us to be strong in this moment and share this word that you've given us for this moment. Let your anointing that is within us now rest upon us. Give us this grace and this strength. In Jesus' name. Can we take 60 seconds and just worship him? Yeah. Come on and help me worship him. When peace like a river, somebody asked me to do this, attended my way. When sorrows like seas, billows roll. My soul Though Try Satan shall Buffet Though trials Will come Let This Bless us Run
Charles Carter was my dude. Um, he was um, on my coming here 32 years ago. Embraced me. Um, there's only been one other deacon in my life who had, who had embraced me like Edward Carter and that was one who became my godfather who had the same name as my father when I moved to Daytona, Roosevelt. He, uh, Roosevelt Taylor. And Deacon Carter and I were, were confidants on a lot of things. Thank you, bro. He took stuff with him, and I'm going to take stuff with me. We, um, we had some great times together, I was preaching out of town and he called me and said, Pastor, I'm coming over. And he come over and um, fly over and we spend time together and I, I never forget, he always laughed at me about this because we were going to drive somewhere else and we had to rent a car and it was going to be about a three, four hour ride so I'm not one that was really too much crazy about about, about driving and so he was renting the car, and the, the lady, she said, well, now, if you're going to put another driver on there, it's going to cost an extra $5. So he was getting the car. Mm -hmm. So I said, Dick, you might as well just, you know, you don't want to waste all that money, man. You know, you might as well just, I don't have to be on there to drive. He looked at me. He said, you must thought I didn't sleep last night. <laughs> he said, you trying to get why? You think, you think I'm too cheap to spend $5? He said, put his name on there so he can help drive, too. We had great great, great times, and one time coming back in from to the airport, I'm going to get to the word, I promise you, I had this really nice um, alligator skin briefcase, and it had messages in it, it had all kinds of things in it, and we got back at the airport, and, and he said, Pastor, I'll hold it for you, and so I said, okay, he wants to carry my briefcase, I ain't got no problem, they're going to dig with your bad self, so he, he set it down while we were waiting for the transportation to come around to get us and somebody snatched it oh yeah they snatched it and struck out running and he struck out he struck out running I didn't know bro could move that fast he, he struck out running trying to pursue this person I was like Dick don't worry about it man don't worry about it you know but whatever the guy jumped on a, a rental car bus and he couldn't catch him he was so heartbroken. Pastor, I just, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Pastor, I'm just so sorry. I said, Dick, it's just a briefcase. I, I said, it's the briefcase is not what I was concerned about. It's the stuff that was in the inside of the briefcase. I'm caring about the briefcase. It was just a lot of other stuff in there. But he was just like so upset. And some of my messages and everything was in that briefcase. And I was sitting in my office one day, and I got a big package in the mail. And whoever the person was that took the briefcase dumped all the contents in the mailbox, in this particular mailbox. And the only thing that was in the mailbox was my stuff. And it had the church's address on some stuff in my briefcase. And I got all of my content back because somebody who did something wrong did something right wrong, wrong right, however you want to say it. And I told him, and he said, Pastor, I feel so much better. I said, why don't you just buy me a new briefcase? He said, let's just leave that alone. But he was such a great man. And we did not agree on all things, on all issues. But here's what you got to understand. Loving somebody doesn't really mean that you have to agree with them on everything. It doesn't mean that you have to agree with them on everything. But you do have to agree to disagree. And you still have to let love prevail. And that's one thing 
that he and I always said to each other. I think I was, I don't know if I was, know if I was one of the first guys that said it, but I always tell people I love them, I love them, I love them. And from the time that I started saying that to him, I was surprised that he would respond back. Because a lot of men kind of think that's a little soft, you know. But I never had a conversation with him, not one conversation, when he hung up the phone and we did not say we love each other. I got a chance to see him before he, he passed, a few days before he passed. And I'm grateful to his life and what he meant to me. So let's go to the word of God, and I'm going to preach this, this message as the Spirit of the Lord gave to me. James chapter number one. James chapter one. As a matter of fact, I'm going to talk about let it be real. Since everybody's singing it and he sang it, I want to talk about, that's what I'm going to talk about today, let it be real. James chapter one, verse 22 to verse 27 in the Living Translation says these words. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. If you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself, and your religion is worthless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Jesus gives us this word in Matthew 5 and 16. Very simple, we all know it. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let it be real. The Apostle James gives to us his biblical discourse. He gives us some challenging theological and doctrinal presentations which are designed to refresh and reform the intentions of our religious tenets and tendencies. Jesus gives us an illuminating mandate that sets the rhythm of our personal Christian testimony. Here's what he says. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. When Jesus makes this statement, it, it means, the when he makes a statement, let your light so shine, this means the personal public activation of your professing spiritual transform, transformation. Let your light so shine. You let it. You do it. So shine before men. This is also accompanied by a, a discipline that keeps your dirty clothes in the closet and your clean ones on the clothesline of public display that they may see right. <laughs> your good works. Now, if Jesus is suggesting to us that we show our good works, then that says to me that we got some bad ones. <laughs> uh, I forgot this is, the, this is the holy crowd we talk, I'm talking to today. So, it, so the idea and, and the reality is, is that everybody in here has some dirty laundry. Uh, today you're just wearing your clean laundry because you're on public display. And that's, it takes a discipline which we don't too much have these days now because everything goes. 
everything goes, but everything really doesn't go. Uh, but everything goes, and when everything goes, everything grows, which means that things are, will begin to harvest what we have sown. If we sow our good works, we shall reap those good works. We sow bad works, we'll reap those bad works. So when we don't have the discipline to control our proclivities and our tendencies as Christians, and we just say anything, do anything openly, and expect that the world is going to get better. It's not going to happen. You know, we live in a society now where everybody is saying to, to speak and live your truth. How about you speak and live his truth? Uh, let it be real. And so he says, Jesus says, um, let your good works be seen before men so that they may glorify the Father which is in heaven. Even though we all have some some bad works, but I, did, I didn't come today to talk about our bad works. You know who, what they are, and I know what they are. I just wish the church would understand that this is not a place filled with perfect people. But the church is a place where people come to strive, to collaborate together, to share our experiences and share our, our differences and our difficulties. But unfortunately, because the hypocritical spirit so exists in the body of Christ, uh, we are unable to experience the, uh, the power that comes with public confession. James says, confess your faults one to the other. Uh, healing can take place in an environment where sick people acknowledge each other's sicknesses and not condemn each other's sicknesses. But that can happen, but it Nobody's going to do that today, especially with Facebook. <laughs> but so when we talk about let it be real, the meaning of let it be real in, in my simple interpretation is don't be fake in your walk with Jesus. Uh, don't be, look at somebody and tell them, uh, don't be fake in your walk with Jesus. Now, Let's, 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 let's talk about that for a second because fake Christianity, fake Christianity is the camouflaging of the human corpse by cosmetically covering a pretended Christian character. Uh, what is it? It's a, it's a makeover instead of a made over. Okay, okay. It's, 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 it's a makeover in, instead of a being made over because when you are made over, that leads to a true spiritual takeover. Yeah, so if you just make over, nothing happens. But when you are made over, that's why when we are saved, the Bible says we become new creatures. We are a new creation. But, but let me put it even more, more simpler than that. Anything that God is in charge of, he changes it. Anything that God is in charge of, he changes it. See, you, can't, you just can't walk close with God and not experience a change in your form and your formations. See, who you are and how you function will absolutely change when you walk with God. When you, when, you, when you walk with God, something's going to happen in your life. Uh, uh, and, and, and you have to, to be a participant in the process of change. Because uh, uh, we, we sometimes have more revolution church than we do evolution church. See, when things are revolving, they are just turning. But when they are evolving, they are changing. When we become Christians, there ought to be some change occurring in our life. Yeah, and, and since we're talking about 
Let It Be Real, uh, one, of, one, of, one of my favorite songs that Deke would sing. Let's talk just music just for a minute. Our hymnology must be akin to our theology. See, music in church can't be for feel-good church. Music in the lost church must both glorify and edify. And when you listen to the songs, the charge to keep I have, that's edifying. Uh, let it be real, that's edifying. Uh, uh, try Jesus, that's, that's edifying. It, it must be lyrically sound in substance and not just rhythmic in beat. Music that makes your heart beat but don't make your heart better is not spiritually healthy or edifying. Yeah, that's why we have to be careful what we sing when we talk about the Lord's house. Because everything from the preaching to the singing to the ushering to the teaching to the, to the service that's rendered, everything has to be edifying the body of Christ. The gifts of the spirit has to be edifying the body of Christ. That's the reason why when, you, when things are quiet and settled in the church and people start speaking in tongues without an interpretation, the Bible says to be quiet in public worship. Why? Because unless there is an interpreter, the other person who are not speaking in tongues cannot be edified and then to suggest then that they need to learn how to speak in tongues is not still in line with biblical teaching because speaking in tongues is not the affirmation that you are a spirit-filled believer Paul says, though I speak with tongues of angels and of men and have not love or charity, it profits me nothing. Because gifts of the Spirit do not qualify and, 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 and authenticate that you are Spirit-filled. you got to have the fruit of the Spirit to, for anybody to know that you are a true Spirit-filled believer. And so whenever I heard Deacon Carter sing, let it be real. Uh, I was more challenged and less entertained because he's challenging us to don't be fake. And one thing you can say about Deacon Edward C. Carter, there was nothing fake about him. He told you how he felt even if you didn't like it. He stood on the principles of what he believed even if you didn't like it. There was nothing pretentious about him. And when he would say, let it be real, I had, with that in mind, that's about being a real Christian. Now somebody might say, what is a Christian? The Christian what, is a, what is a real Christian? Well, let's, let's, let's find out. What, is, what does it mean to be real as a Christian? The first thing it means is to be relatively, to be righteously relative. That's what it means to be righteously relative. See, man's righteousness is never reliable. I said man's righteousness is never reliable. Don't put your money on that. Don't, don't, don't put your money, don't put your money on that. That's the reason why in my preaching I've always said do not put me on a platform. Do not worship me because I can't live up to that standard. I'm too flawed to be flashy. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, now some people uh, put the pressure on the preacher because uh, I don't understand how imperfect pews can expect a perfect pulpit. Yeah, come on. Let's just, let's just, yeah, yeah, you know, we, just, we got a few minutes. We got a few minutes. Let's just be real. They expect us to be perfect. They, 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 and then, and then, and then, and then they'll find scripture and they'll say to whom much is given, much is required. But when that scripture is mentioned, it's not directed to the preacher. It's directed to every believer. Come on. To whom much is given, much is required. That means being a good steward of that which God, it doesn't mean that one person got to be better than the other person. Another person should be more this or more of that. Yes, leaders should be mature. They, they should have certain gifts and, and, and certain abilities and certain unctions and functions in order, to be, in order to be leaders. But we put the pressure where the pressure is not necessary because all of us is given the grace of God in everything that we do. And so man's righteousness must, is, is never, re, never reliable. But the word of God is our reference for growth and righteousness through Christ's fulfillment of the law. James says it. James says for us to look carefully into the perfect law, the perfect gospel.
that sets you free. We are free. See, we must see ourselves through the eyes of the son, not someone else. For we are justified by our faith. We are declared righteous by our faith in Jesus Christ. And the beauty part, what I like about, like about God is oftentimes he will approve us before he proves us. I said he, he will, oh, you, you don't believe me, ask Jesus. Jesus comes to the Jordan River to be baptized. And John, he's baptized and the heavens open and, and, and his father spoke and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then the Bible says after that and the dove did what it did, then the spirit led him, <laughs> led him into the wilderness to be tempted, tried, tested of the devil. But what had happened is every son needs affirmation before he has confrontation. You're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. I said, every son, every son needs affirmation before he experiences confrontation. Because if he's been affirmed by his father, then confrontation is easy to match. Because not only do you have the father's approval, you have his protection. You have his provisions. That's why when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, he referenced the word of God. It is written. That man should not live by bread. And he, and he goes on and on and on. So we are justified by our faith in Christ, not by our own works. Deacon Carter understood the distancing difference between his personal human fallacies and his personal and professing honorable faith. That's why he had songs like Try Jesus looped in his memory. Come on now. Now, he also, you know, he also had his own key. <laughs> you know, he, Deke had his own key. He had his own rhythm to every song. It's, 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 what, it's what I would call his preferred rhythm. Uh, you, you could be, he'd be halfway through one part and start in another part. You just have to just keep up with his beat. And that's what God calls us to do for each other because we all have different rhythms. We all have different beats. And sometimes it's a sacrifice, but we have to sometimes adjust to other people's beat to help them finish their song. Please don't miss that. See, we're too busy trying to get people on our own beat. We're too busy God never told us to change anybody. He is responsible for the changing and of, and of the process. That's why you got to love people as they are. You got to love them because God knows how to get people to where he needs them to be. The church is not, is not our responsibility to change people. We're supposed to create an atmosphere where change can happen in the lives of people at the pace by which the Holy Spirit is going to change them because it is not you or I that has even changed ourselves. You know it. And I know it that if it was not for the Holy Spirit in us, I would not have matured in the way that I have matured. I wouldn't be disciplined because if I would have had it my way, I'd have did a whole lot of freaky nasty things. But it's only because of the grace of God who come on now, who understood my rhythm and understood my beat. And he walked with me through the process and all I had to do was stay on the path. And as long as I stayed on the path and didn't lean to my own understanding, then he would, he would do what needs to do in my life. He would make the provision that I needed in my life. So we have to be, we have to be uh, righteously relative. But then we have to be also, in order to be, in order to be real, we have to be evangelistically engaging. Let me ask you a question because James talks about it. What are you doing? Who are you really helping? What sinners are you sharing your faith with? You see, there's nothing wrong with religion at all, which is really a system of, of, of beliefs and worship of a deity far greater than any human power. But a religion that does nothing is nothing. Jesus said, let it shine. 
James says, don't just hear it, do it. Do it. Do, he, he says, do it. Do it. We, we have to do church. I mean, we do church, but we don't do it consistently because we don't be it convertingly. Because the word says, the word says, and ye shall be witnesses of me. He didn't say you shall do it. He said you shall be it because whatever you be, you will do. Why? Because you can't help it because that's what you be. See, you, you be who you are because that's who you are. You act that way. You know, people took me and say, well, that wasn't me. No, that was you. Well, you know, that was the devil when I was lying. No, that was you lying. You know what I'm saying? It was, you know, none of, then all of that was you. And once you own it as you, then you'll be able to help yourself. Because anything you're in denial about about yourself, you can't get delivered from it. And then sometimes your greatest deliverance is going to be your ability to discipline the thing that you still know how to do. You just know that you shouldn't do it. So you're disciplining it even though you still know how to do it. But we are called to witness. And any believer who says he is a believer, you do not want to stand before God having not shared your testimony, having not shared your faith. I'm not talking about I want to thank the Lord for waking me up this morning, clothing me in my right mind. Give me all. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about I used to be a liar. I would lie every chance I get, but I had an encounter with Jesus. Come on, I used to be a homosexual. I ain't saying me. I'm just talking now. I mean, everybody got their own thing, right? So that they're dealing with what I'm trying to help us understand is that all of us have something that we can give a testimony about. Because whatever God has delivered you from, he's delivered you for. And what is happening is we are too busy not sharing our faith. And one of the things I love about Deacon Carter, I don't care where we went in a restaurant, you can pull in a drive through he going to find some kind of way to say, do you know the Lord? Do you, do you know the Lord? I said, just leave the tip. Do you know the Lord? So let me tell you about the Lord. I said, oh, he's going to start singing, try Jesus in this restaurant. I know it. I know he's going to do it. And I've seen him do it. What I'm trying to tell you is that you've got to have such a kind of conviction about who you are in God that you don't have a problem when that thing hits you. If the Spirit of the Lord tells you to minister, to share your testimony, stop trying to make it pretty. The world don't need pretty. They need dirty that's been cleaned up. They need to hear that you were a drug addict, but God delivered you. They need to hear that you were strung out on alcohol, but God delivered you. They need to hear that you backslid many times and you came back to God. And Edward Carter was real. He witnessed that's the reason why we didn't, we didn't name the Try Jesus Award because we was trying to play to him, to play to his ego. Because he not only said it, but he lived it. He found a way in conversations to talk about the Lord. When the last time you found somebody who didn't know God and you shared your faith. I'm not talking about oh, what church you go to. Who cares about what church you go to? How much God do you know? Do you even know how to share the plan of salvation? Do, do you know how to even be saved? These are things that the church don't like to be challenged on. And I'm saying we got an evangelist who's laying here before us. Didn't have the title of evangelist. But evangelism is not a title. Come on now. It's a responsibility of every believer. Every child of God is responsible for witnessing and sharing their faith with other non-believers. But all we do is blink, blink our lights among each other and nobody in darkness is helping. We don't just have people like this in our midst and they live that life and we just be sad. Because there's so much legacy. So much stuff that we can, we can see. We don't have to see the, we don't have to see the bad. We don't have to see the disagreements. But this man shared his faith. I witnessed it. So once I witnessed him, can't nobody tell me what I didn't see. He was a witness. And we all should be. So if you're going to be real, you got to be evangelistically engaging. Number three, and I'm almost done. We have to be authentically aligned to God. Everybody that's that's filling the seats is not filled with the Savior. We are facing 
some critical times. And I'm just hoping, and I promise the Lord every chance that I get, whether it's funeral, whatever it is, I'm going to be a voice. Because we've been through some serious stuff. And something in us has to change. Something in how we do church is changing. And we can't stop it. How are we going to get the unsaved in the pews? I'm not worried about the people who are members. Maybe we needed to create some space for real church work. But those of us who are aligned with God got to get this understanding and revelation because our connection to God is our protection. When we are connected to him and because we are connected to him, we are protected from any and everything. Now watch this. We're not kept from everything. But we are protected. Even in death we are protected. Because even what death does is death puts us closer to him. So we're not, we're not, we're not uh, 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 exempt from sickness and, and, and disease because we live in a physical body in a physical world. But, but because we are connected to Christ, we have privileges, we have promises, we have provisions that, that helps us to understand that I don't have to panic in a crisis. Because I'm aligned to a power. And then finally, we have to be lovingly liberated. What are you saying? That's real, R-E-A-L. That's real. Are you so walking in the grace of love that you dare fix your mouth to spew evil against another? Love is the foundation upon which all faith in Christ rests. If you don't love, you're lost. I said, if you don't love, you're lost. See, once you've been liberated by love, you can't live your life by fear and shame because love is liberating. Here's how James puts it. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God, the Father, means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. There's a resistance that we must have to the point where we don't allow the world system to corrupt our conduct, taint our testimony, or mute our mandate to be voices for Christ. But when you have love, there are a lot of people in this room that I have relationships with. Some I can see, some I can't see. Some behind me, Artie Jackson. Who's back there? Al Jackson. These are my confidants. These are, these are men who I love, Pastor Whitaker, saw him out there, um, and, and others. I think I saw Elder Coleman, my brother's out there, my brother's back here. Relationships, when they are spiritual and not physical, they can, it's Michael Simonette, they can survive. They can survive all challenges. Because love is liberating. Now you got to let love liberate you as a believer. Because you got to love folk who don't love you back. You got to love people who disagree with you. And you can never let disagreements get you so disgruntled to where you speak things that you shouldn't speak. You, you, you can't do it. I don't care who you are, preacher, uh, uh, member, whoever you are. Because anything that you curse, it can't bless you. See, if I, if I curse you, Al, if I speak all man of evil against you, you can't be a blessing to me. Not because you don't want to, but I prevented you from doing it because I cursed you. But if I bless you, 
no matter what, no matter if, 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 I, if, if I bless you, God has a way of giving me a harvest out of you. Likewise, likewise, likewise. See, we are responsible for loving, not being loved. We are responsible for loving. And what, and what, and what James says to us is don't let the world corrupt you. When you love and you have the love of God in you, if you listen, he won't let it happen. You won't let it happen. You, you won't let because the world said it's okay, y'all. It, it can't just be okay because the world said it's okay. As believers in Christ Jesus, we got to let it be real. We have to be the voice for God in the world that says, but that's not what God says. Because we live in popularity Christianity and popularity celebrity church, we want to be liked. We want to be liked. We want, we want, we want likes on Facebook. We want followers in, on Twitter. We want, we want that. But I will die knowing that I love like God taught me to love and forgave like God taught me to forgive. And I will not allow anybody to rob that of me because I believe that I'm a real Christian. I believe I have a relationship with Christ. I do. I know it. I know that I share the word with God. I know that I'm aligned to him and I know that I love liberally because I've been given that love. That's Deacon Edward Carter. Let it be real. As, as the blind man that that was that Jesus healed the young man when they came to question what happened to him his mother says his parents said he's he's of age he can speak for himself I've said my part and physically I need to sit down but he's a he's a grown man he can never Carter can speak for himself I'm nauseous Ah, God bless you. Come on, you come on, please. Divine providence of God to have y'all here. I, I, I want to say this some time ago. Y'all don't have to worry about giving me a lot of flowers. I saw my flowers. I smelled my flowers yesterday. They all was here. You don't have to make the floors rich. And Elliot, thank you. Thank you for being a man. Thank you for all of this stuff that you've done and still doing. Sharon, I want to thank you. You don't always call me on Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Martha, thank you for marrying your wife, my daughter, to do things because she couldn't do them if you didn't allow through them. You was kicking against her. I imagine that she was would satisfy her. Thank you so much. The family up there, yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And bless your heart. We love you. Say amen. You always have a great thing to say, and you want the best for us. And thank you for all the stuff that you for this family. Thank you so much. I just thank everybody. I don't have words. Uh, just to thank everybody. And big old, I bless you. Man, I, 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 I don't know what we can do for you. You have, you, you have done so much. That's your man. I mean, Bravely. so here's a man stepped in. This man, he's the son I have that I didn't give birth to. This is a great bro. This is a great bro. About my lovely wife. If y'all only knew what she done and doing for me. You want to make sure that I 
am okay. Mm-hmm. And, and she, she, she really, she's a diehard on there. And I just, I could never thank her for it. And, and the Lord called me home, baby. You can shed some tears because I'm gone, but don't because you didn't do what you were supposed to do as a wife. Now is the time where you can talk to yourself and thank them for what all they done for me and let y'all know exactly how I feel. And then, it's the, him out there to say, when that awful day we should have gone, when it out will make hate. When I must stay. <laughs> oh my God, y'all don't have to worry about that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it there. I'm not gonna, I could go on and on and on and on. But I told you, it, 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 just of it, and uh, and I've been taking y'all down through the years, so I'm leaving it there. I don't have to say no more. Can we thank Pastor Artie Jackson? My right hand. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. Redeemer liveth and shall stand upon the latter day. And though these skin worms destroy this flesh of mine, 